For years, Dr. Audrey Zucker-Levin explored one question. When someone undergoes the amputation of a limb, why is it that after that amputation, some people appear to use their prosthesis, their artificial limb, easily? Why is it that others appear to struggle? Well, after a move that took Audrey and her husband 3,000 kilometers north, she's uncovering answers and ways certain adaptations make life better for amputees. Audrey Zucker-Levin is our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and we recorded this episode on Thursday, January the 27th. We're joined by Dr. Audrey Zucker-Levin, who's a professor of physical therapy at the University of Saskatchewan's School of Rehabilitation Science. She's also an American Physical Therapy Association board-certified geriatric clinical specialist. Audrey specializes in making life better for patients after an amputation. Audrey joins us now. Hello there. Hi, Jen. Nice to be here. Well, I'm wondering what it was that brought you 3,000 kilometers north. <laughs> That's a great question. So fortunately, uh, we denested in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and we started looking around for some other opportunities. And my husband was offered a great opportunity as the Provincial Multiple Sclerosis Research Chair. And after a long discussion, we decided we loved Canada and we gave it a shot. So you guys are a two-for-one deal. We were a two-for-one. <laughs> we love it here. Um, both Michael and I are happy. We were embraced by the medical and the research community. Both of our work is being really taken up and well-received by the community. So things are going well. We are both enjoying it, and we look forward to staying. And I, it's funny, because I introduced you there as a board-certified geriatric clinical specialist, but... Research is really where it's at for you. And I want to know if you can take us back. Where did this interest in helping people with amputations come from? So I um, graduated physical therapy school more than 30 years ago. And when I started my first job in New York City, and so I was a clinical therapist. I was treating the patients who were in the hospital. But in my spare time, there was this little room sort of off to the side where these researchers were always in there. I kept sort of basically showing up at any time I had spare time or in the morning or in the afternoon. And so they just put me to work. And in that lab, oh. yeah, it was great. And in that lab, we were working on a better understanding of the abilities of people to walk or to uh, initiate movement or to control Either sometimes it was a person with an amputation with a prosthesis, sometimes it was a child with cerebral palsy. And this was sort of the start of what we look at now in many modern gait labs as kind of assessing what the appropriate intervention for this person would be to help them function better. So I was very intrigued by the prostheses, by the mechanical and the physiologic connection. So I kept sort of showing up in this lab and they put me to work and that was the beginning. So that was about over 30 years ago. Well, when you say gate lab, it, it's funny because I realize that's okay. We're talking about walking, about the way we walk, the way our brain puts together the signals for the rest of our body to do its thing. But back then, what did the research and lab work look like compared to today? Wow. So it's analogous to sort of like uh, video games and um, the animation that's used in movies. And actually, some of the technology was the same. Back then, it was very choppy. It took a long time. You know, if you were to look back at a movie that was done in the 30s, the animation, you would just be like, hmm, not impressed. We would spend hours with the patient. And then after that, it would take days to analyze the data and many people, whereas today, Today, you can bring a person into a laboratory setting and assess how they're moving in 
an hour or two hours, and then you would get the data processed through the, the computation, which is also much better, within an hour or so, or almost immediately, depending on the system that you're using. So assessing where the people are, so how much their knee is bent, how much their hip is bent, and then what are the muscles that do this? So we put these electromyography or EMG on muscles. So we could say when the knee is here, this is how much muscle activity is being performed. And then we can also oh. look. Yeah. And then we can also you can, sort- you can see that. Like I'm picturing little dots lighting up. Oh, that exactly. muscle is engaged. We can see it on a screen. Exactly. And then you can also look at when you step on the ground, the ground kind of pushes you back and you can measure what that force is. And then the vector, where the force is going. And so you put the picture together and you say, based on this information, this is a problem. And this is where the target needs to be addressed. So like now, if you watch a movie, the avatars, they look like real people. Like you could say, oh, that's supposed to be this actor just by the way they're moving. So we're trying to do that same thing with people with physical limitations who have walking disability. And so the technology has just improved so much that we're able to do it and we're able to apply it, and which is what I had been doing at the University of Tennessee. I was there for 20 years. And so we were applying this technology to determine which prosthetic foot or which prosthetic knee would make the person who's already pretty high functioning, make them function better. How could I use this to make you jump higher, make you walk smoother, make it be less energy demand for your heart and your lungs. And so we were very dependent upon the technology of the prosthesis, as well as the ability of the person. And we were trying to match them. It was fascinating work. Well, and when you arrived at the University of Tennessee, at that point, did you have your doctorate? No, I didn't. That's a great question. So I went from the hospital in New York City And at that time, I was very fortunate that they would sponsor somebody to go back for a higher degree as long as it applied to the hospital. And so I went, I started my PhD part time while I was in New York. And then I moved from New York after six years to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. My husband uh, was doing a fellowship at NIH, so I decided to move with him. Mm -hmm. And so I worked at Hopkins and I sort of put that PhD on hold. I went back to my clinical roots. And then I thought we were going to go back to New York, to be very honest with you, but we decided to go to Memphis, Tennessee, which was a great move. So we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and I resumed my PhD studies while I started, I had just started a job at the University of Tennessee as a faculty member. Um, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wait, and, but you said, I thought your PhD was in New York City. So how are you handling this? (laughs) So by then we had a babe in arms and a toddler. So we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and I flew back and forth to New York every other week with the two little ones um, for about two days. Fortunately, my family was still in New York, so I would hand the kids off and and go. But it was quite the challenge. And so I worked full time in Tennessee. I was a part time student at NYU working on my Ph.D. and I was a full time mom. So uh, it's funny, I'm a, I'm a faculty member now and I teach the students and often I hear, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. And I, I really empathize with them because I've been there. I've been to the place where you have six different things that, are, that you are responsible for and you, you have to figure out that balance and it's not easy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just picturing all those balls you were trying to juggle. What, what kept you going, Audrey, through this? Well... Especially with the young children, the babe in arms and a toddler. Um, You know, I was very fortunate. I I, I have to admit my husband was wonderful and and picked up when I when I absolutely couldn't do something. But but I really enjoyed the research. I really enjoyed that ability to kind of try to figure out how to make people or help people function easier or better. And we didn't have the technology that I was using at the University of Tennessee, it was still early, and we didn't have a lab there. So I did my research at NYU, and I would I would come in, and, and we didn't have the technology we have today where Zoom was an easy way to go to class, right? Or oh, yeah. My, so so I had no choice but to get on that airplane and go. And, 
And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I was, I was still flying back when September 11th hit and I told my chair, I said, I, I can't get on that airplane. I just, I, I just can't. And she was so understanding. She said, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So I was, I was so fortunate. I'm getting a little emotional. I was so fortunate that everybody was like behind me with this. I had a lot of support, you know, that we want you to get through this. And we did. I'm kind of wondering in like this body of work, what have you learned about the brain and the the role it plays in terms of helping us learn to walk again. But if you're missing part of that leg, missing part of that foot. Right. Yeah. So when I moved to Canada, when we moved to Canada, I, I sort of stepped back and I thought, hmm, I have been helping people to run, to jump, to dance, to do all of these things that are important to walk. But how do I help that person who isn't able to walk and isn't able to run, who has faced limb loss. I kind of did a step back and I said, what is really important? You know, how can I make the most impact? So I was really, really fortunate. I brought a PhD student with me. Oh. And, she, and yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. And um, got together, we got some funding from Skipper, which is the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research. And we got together what we called the PORT, the Patient-Oriented Research Team. These were people in the community who were living with limb loss. And we got together, so we called it the PORT Team, and we also had physical therapists and researchers and physicians and prosthetists and social workers. We all came together and we talked many times over more than a year, and, and the group is still going on, to really say, well, what's important here? How can we help not the the person who's already pretty high functioning, but the typical person with limb loss who has difficulty using a prosthesis? It's not so easy. They helped us sort of focus the direction of the research that we went into. And that direction was really a few things. It was how does the population of people with limb loss in Saskatchewan compare to that of Canada and other countries, you know, that was important because that, that information wasn't there. The second part was people have what's called phantom limb sensation. So that means that when you lose a limb, you've had this limb for years and years and years, your brain still says, oh, my leg is still there or my hand is still there. And in some people, this causes discomfort. It causes, they'll describe it as my hand feels like it's cramped into a ball and I can't move it. And oh. some, yeah. And some people will say, no problem. I can move my ankle all over the place. And I think it actually helps me. So we thought that this would be an interesting sort of line of research. The question being, do people who have better control and better perception of their phantom limb actually have better function with or without a prosthesis. I was able to get some more funding and we were able to do a study that used MRI. And we put a bunch of people who have lower leg amputation in the MRI and we looked at how their brain functions. And what we, yeah. And so we actually, while they were in the MRI, we had them move both their intact limb, so the left foot, let's say, and we had them move the foot they no longer have, their phantom foot. And we found differences in what the brain was doing when moving the phantom limb and moving the intact limb. Hmm. And we also found that people who have reported better control over their phantom limb and better function while using a prosthesis had different activity than those people who had poorer control or had less 
uh, ability to use their prosthesis. Um, it's almost like the brain imagining it's still controlling the thing that's there seems helpful. It does. It absolutely does. And, and what we see is basically if you don't use it, you lose it. It's sort of like muscle strength. If you don't use it, it kind of goes away. What happens in the brain, we think, is that the area that, let's say, was controlling a, a foot that no longer exists, basically it's the surrounding area says, hey, you're not using this anymore, so I'm going to encroach. I'm going to plant my plants you know, my garden in your yard because you're not using this anymore. And we think that <laughs> it's true. So we think that it's that sort of encroachment of the areas that used to control the foot that are creating confusion and discomfort in the foot that no longer exists. So there's more exploration to go there. And we have some papers that hopefully will be published within the five to six months, we've analyzed the data, we just have to kind of get it together. So that's sort of one direction that we're going. And, yeah. and my PhD student was exploring that. Sort of the neuroscience we, behind what happens with yeah. these phantom sensations. It's fantastic. So then the other thing that, that's important, sort of this, how do you prevent limb loss? So the majority of people who lose their leg so below the knee is the most common um, amputation. Um, mm. Their lower leg, so below the knee, uh, have diabetes. And we know that, unfortunately, uh, diabetes is on the rise. And there are many reasons for this. And there are many people exploring this. But what happens is people lose the sensation in their foot and they get a wound. And that wound has trouble healing because the blood supply is impaired. So the other direction that we're going is sort of how do we help heal this wound so that people do not go on to have limb loss and then hopefully won't need a prosthesis, right? Yeah. So yeah. Keep the original need... if you can. Exactly. Keep the original. So we have a collaboration going with some of the physicians at St. Paul's Hospital. Unfortunately, COVID has definitely put a damper on patient recruitment, but we're trying to identify people who have a specific type of wound on the bottom of their foot that's caused by diabetes, and we're going to intervene with a non-traditional intervention. Um, most people are given crutches or a walker to, to use when they're trying to heal this wound, but we're going to give them one of these scooters, and you might have seen them around if somebody has an ankle fracture, or they might have these kind of wheelie things that look like scooters, and they move around pretty easily, and we're trying to figure out yeah, they they actually look really neat compared to like the crutches I remember sort of trying to hobble around on with a like twisted ankle in, in school. Yes, Those crutches they, were hard. They are. They're very difficult. And what happens when you have to use crutches, then you end up being more sedentary, which is what we don't want people to do. So we're thinking, and we're not sure, but if we maybe give somebody one of these walkers, one of these wheelie things, maybe they're physical function won't decline because they'll be sedentary while the wound is healing. Maybe the wound will heal better and maybe their mood, right, will be better because they're not as sedentary. But once again, we also don't know if, if it's going to perhaps cause some balance problems in a person who's already got some sensory loss in the bottom of their foot. So we're not sure it's safe yet. So that's part of the reason why we need to do this study. And hopefully we'll get that going back to going when COVID uh, subsides a bit. And then we have one more study. We have another one that's going oh, okay. on. <laughs> okay. um, and this is a, a great collaboration that we're doing, also bringing some people from Manitoba in on this one. And this is with another PhD student that I have that he's looking at if we exercise the phantom limb, so the limb that no longer exists, if we actually put somebody on an exercise program to improve the person's ability to move it, Will it improve their overall function, whether they use a prosthesis or not? So hmm. we're able to start recruiting hopefully in about a month. So we've got a lot of things going. And our goal is to improve function in people who have limb loss and to prevent limb loss in people who might be at high risk.
looking at this from a patient's perspective, what kind of feedback has there been? Like, You know, having the patient perspective is so important. I go to amputee clinic at City Hospital and I talk to the patients. I've gone down to Regina to Wascana Rehabilitation Center and I've talked to the patients and to the clinicians there. And our PORT team, our patient-oriented research team, really allows the patient to say, this is what's important. So having that input, because my saying, I'm matching this foot to that person to make them walk better. They'll say, well, that's important, but I'm not that person who runs. I'm not that person who can dance. I want somebody to help me walk even just a little bit easier or someone to tell me, how do I get rid of this phantom limb pain? This is what's important to me. So my research direction has definitely changed and it was because of what's important to them. You know, I... Fortunately, I, I am not an amputee, so I don't know what's important, what really is important, what I think might be cool. The prosthetic stuff, which is really, really cool, might not be so important to that patient. You know, my, my analogy is if you're a very young person who wants to go and run, if I gave you a foot that's equivalent to a minivan, you wouldn't be happy with me. <laughs> but, but on the contrary, if you were an older person who perhaps is not going to be running and not going to be playing basketball. If I gave you a foot that was the equivalent of a Ferrari, you would have balance problems. So the categories of feet are much like cars. So a younger person might get something in the, in the Ferrari category, whereas a person who isn't as, as high functioning as that younger person would get something maybe like a sedan or a minivan, depending on the need. Uh, so Something reliable that you can take to the grocery store. Exactly. So now I'm <laughs> focusing sort of on the broader picture of how can I make people with limb loss or who are facing perhaps possible limb loss, how can I make their lives better? Audrey, it is so cool hearing about this, and I wish you all the best with all these research projects. You've got a busy year ahead of you. I'm excited. Well, thank you for joining us here on the podcast. Thanks, Jen. It's really been my pleasure. Audrey Zucker-Levin is a specialist in regaining function after limb loss. She's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan's School of Rehabilitation Science. She and her research team are working on four publications, including how the brain changes in people with limb loss, how those phantom sensations she mentioned, how they can impact function, how to prevent amputation and limb loss in people who have diabetes. To find out more about what Audrey's working on, go to the Rehabilitation Science website. That's Rehab Science, all one word, rehabscience.usask.ca. Researchers Under the Scope is presented by the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. And we record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respect to the First Nations and the Métis ancestors of this place. We reaffirm our relationship with one another. And we want to thank you for tuning in. I'm Jen Cannell, and hit those three little dots in the corner of your podcast app to follow us and stay up to date.